Well, hello and welcome to this special session from NCOA's Center for Healthy Aging that will provide an update of progress regarding the Falls Free National Falls Prevention Action Plan. And we're gonna talk about priorities for the future. I'm Kathy Cameron, I'm the Senior Director of NCOA's Center for Healthy Aging. And I'm honored also to lead the ACL funded National Falls Prevention Resource Center. Um, I hope you all enjoy the plenary sessions this morning, including the terrific keynote address from uh, Joe Coughlin from MIT's Age Lab. So to begin, um, I'd like to share a little bit of background about the 2015 Falls Free National Action Plan. Um, we consider this plan a blueprint for describing what should be done to reduce the growing number of falls and fall related injuries among older adults. This plan built on the original Falls Free National Action Plan that was released in 2005. Um, and the plan is a product of key recommendations and strategies that were collected during a National Falls Prevention Summit, which was part of the White House Conference on Aging event that was held in April of 2015. Um, and I wanna give a shout out to the Administration for Community Living because they really helped support this summit that took place in 2015 and, and has helped us um, in realizing some of the goals and action steps of this plan. And just uh, by way of background, a little bit about the 2015 White House Conference on Aging. It, it marked the 50th anniversary of Medicare, Medicaid, and the Older Americans Act. And it was a time to look ahead to issues that would shape the lives of older adults uh, for the next decade. And healthy aging was a big part of those discussions and the administration really thought false prevention needed to have its own summit. So it really provided you know, a great opportunity for us to revisit and update the, 20, the 2005 false prevention action plan and to assess progress, successes and gaps. Um, at that summit, we had experts from around the country in falls prevention. We had representatives from organizations, from the health and aging sectors. We had federal and state agencies representative, prof professionals associations, corporations, foundations that all have an interest in healthy aging. They were invited to be part of this summit and to think through solutions and contribute to the new plan. And the recommendations and strategies from that summit um, were the foundation um, for the 2015 uh, Falls Free National Action Plan. So we really think of um, our current plan as a framework for action, as I've mentioned, for falls prevention across the nation. And the plan envisions uh, older adults experiencing fewer falls and fall-related injuries, maximizing their independence and their quality of life. And the plan outlines specific strategies and action steps to affect sustained initiatives. That was a really important part of it, sustained initiatives that reduce falls and injuries among older adults. The plan has 12 broad goals, 40 strategies, and 240 action steps focusing on a myriad of issues that impact falls risks, such as physical mobility, medication management, enhancing home and environmental safety, increasing public awareness and education and funding, an expansion of falls risk screening, assessment, and interventions. And since 2015, over the past five years, um, we at NCOA, um, we've partnered with so many different professionals in health and aging um, across the country. We've worked with federal agencies, of course, ACL, but also agencies like, like HUD around home safety. Um, we've worked with professional associations consumer and caregiver organizations. We developed a caregiver conversation guide um, around falls prevention with the National Alliance for Caregiving. We worked very closely with state and local falls prevention coalitions, corporations, and foundations. Um, so we've done a lot and the intent of this plan wasn't that it was just gonna be NCOA run. We really wanted it to be a collaborative effort. So I'm delighted today to introduce several key partners who we have worked with over the past five years to accomplish select strategies and action steps that are outlined in the plan. And now I'd like to um, introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have Ann Dellinger, who serves as Chief of the Applied Sciences Branch of the Division of Injury Prevention at the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention's 
National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. Um, there she oversees the older adult falls work um, of that center, as well as many other things. Um, we also have Sara Asawana. She is the Deputy Staff Director on the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging for Chairman Susan Collins. And Sara works to advance legislative, budgetary, and oversight proposals in, the, in Chairman Collins' priorities, including health and long-term care, biomedical research, and cures, and population health and well-being. Next, we have Samantha Kohler, and Samantha is a senior policy aide for ranking member Bob Casey, who you heard from earlier today um, during that wonderful video. Um, also, she's with the uh, Senate Special Committee on Aging, and she oversees issues related to the intersection of health and aging policy, including the Older Americans Act, rural health, Medicare access, and affordability. Next, we have John Pinos who is the UPS Foundation professor, professor of Gerontology, Policy and Planning at the University of Southern California's Leonard Davis School of Gerontology, where he directs the USC's Fall Prevention Center of Excellence. Um, and John, uh, a couple of years ago, became the principal investigator of promoting aging in place by enhancing access to home modifications. And that's a three-year project funded by the Administration for Community Living that he'll be talking about. And joining John uh, from the University of Southern California is Emily Neighbors, who is the program manager of the Fall Prevention Center of Excellence, also at the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. And her work aims to educate service providers and professionals on falls prevention with a focus on home modification and aging in place. Um, next, we have um, Ellen Schneider, who is the director of policy and programming with the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance at the Thurston Arthritis Research Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, Ellen's areas of focus include evidence-based health promotion and disease prevention programs, osteoarthritis, healthy aging, false prevention, and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and Ellen's gonna talk today about the work that she does in managing the review process for evidence-based health promotion and disease prevention programs. So that is our panel today. Um, we don't have any PowerPoints. If this is really um, a Q&A discussion that we're having, again, looking at um, where we've come um, and some of the priorities for the future related to falls prevention. So I really wanna thank you all for joining us for this session. Um, and I'd like to encourage you to participate by submitting questions um, in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then we'll take some of these questions at the end of our session today. And you probably know this already, but all of you will be on mute um, during the session. So again, thank you for joining. And um, I'd like to start the discussion with um, a question for Ann Dellinger from the CDC. And the CDC you know, really has been a, a key partner um, with, with many of us across the country on falls prevention. Um, they're the place where we go to for, for data, um, clinical um, education, et cetera, around falls prevention. So Anne, um, what are CDC's most significant accomplishments during the, fact, the last uh, five years, particularly related to um, educating clinicians about how they can be um, take a greater role in false prevention, whatever you know setting they might be working in. Um, there were several recommendations in our action plan about getting clinicians more involved. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, I'm I'm delighted to be here today um, to talk about the CDC fall prevention work. Um, and I would say that CDC's most significant accomplishment is creating the STEADY initiative. And I know that folks have heard about STEADY for a long time, but this is the initiative and this is based on the CDC STEADY toolkit that was just designed for physicians. And we've built on that and expanded it and launched a broader STEADY initiative, which offers all healthcare providers, that's including physicians and nurses and pharmacists and physical therapists among others, it offers guidance on how to incorporate fall prevention 
enter their practice using the three critical steps to prevent falls, right? So you screen all older adults for fall risk, you assess a patient's modifiable risk factors, and then you intervene to reduce the risk factors using effective clinical and community interventions. So we still have all the original toolkit materials, but we also have a coordinated care plan that tells you how to implement a steady-based fall prevention program. And then we have the companion evaluation guide that helps you measure your program success. We have free online continuing education. Um, and then we've done research on the feasibility and effectiveness of implementing a steady-based clinical fall prevention program. We're really reinforcing the message that fall prevention needs a team-based approach. And I'll give you an example. We have materials and online training designed specifically for and with pharmacists called Steady RX. Um, and as medication experts, pharmacists can help reduce fall risk by using Steady RX. And I'll say more about that at my uh, 3.30 session. In last year, we published a study that estimated the prevalence of psychoactive medication use in community dwelling older adults. You know, these medications can cause dizziness, confusion, sleepiness that can increase fall risk. So we found that more than half of older adults used at least one psychoactive medication during the year and about 10 used three or more. In another study, we found that most older adults were unaware of these potential fall risks associated with their medications, but that they were willing to change their medications if a healthcare provider recommended it. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I'd um, uh, like to tell you to answer this question is, in addition to broadening study to a variety of healthcare providers, we're also broadening it beyond a single focus on primary care settings, because we really feel that pro fall prevention should be considered within other types of clinical settings. So we're working with the University of California, San Francisco to develop guidance on how to prevent falls after an older adult has been hospitalized. And it's intended to strengthen the continuum of care when an older adult is discharged from a hospital back home um, and the goal is to reduce fall-related readmissions. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow. And that was terrific. Yeah. Yeah. The importance of clinical care, interdisciplinary care is so important. I love that, that care transitions program. Yeah. As we say, it takes a village. So thank you for those updates. Wonderful. So in addition to what happens in clinical settings, um, when we put together the National Action Plan, we thought a lot about, you know, what can be done in community-based settings. So one of the recommendations of the mm -hmm. National Action Plan was to expand the availability of evidence-based falls prevention programs. And Ellen, I'd like to ask you um, about the work that you've done over the last couple of years, if you could share, you know, really what has been done since 2015 to identify new evidence-based falls prevention programs. Sure, thanks, Kathy. So since 2015, we have created a new review process to identify and approve new evidence-based falls prevention programs that meet ACL's evidence-based program criteria and are then eligible for Title III-D and other ACL discretionary funding. So it's an extensive review process that's actually divided into two stages. Just real quickly, the first stage evaluates a program's outcomes, effectiveness, and publications. And if a program is approved for stage one, then the applicant is invited to apply for stage two to evaluate the program's implementation processes, quality assurance measures, and availability of technical assistance. And we have qualified reviewers from across the country who are carefully evaluating the applications. And then they conduct their independent reviews. And then we have reviewer panel calls to further discuss each application to determine whether it meets the ACL evidence-based program criteria. Programs that are then determined to meet all of the ACL criteria, the evidence-based program criteria, not, not just the majority, but it's got to be all of it. Uh, are then added to the Title III-D program approved list. And since 2015, we have added six 
evidence-based fault prevention programs to the Title III-D approved evidence-based program list. And these pro programs address a variety of falls risks and audiences. And there's more information online about the review process if you just Google UNC evidence-based program review process or just feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ellen. Yeah, it's been really exciting to see that process evolve mm -hmm. over the last couple of years and uh, wonderful mm -hmm. to see the number of programs that have been approved, um, whether or not they've been approved because they have reduced falls risk or actually reduced falls themselves. So mm -hmm. thank you for your, your work on that process and getting that established. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Well, next I'd like to turn to um, John Pinus, um, who actually co-chaired the Home Safety Breakout Group at the National uh, Falls Prevention Summit in 2015. And he helped us develop the um, home safety recommendations in the National Action Plan. Um, so John, um, in what areas related to home safety and home modifications do you feel that we've come the furthest over the last five years? First, I'd like to uh, commend NCOA for its leadership in this field. It's made a huge difference of pulling people together, addressing issues, and one of them has been home modifications. And home modifications is important because most falls occur in the home or near the home, and um, some of the programs include home modifications. Many do not. Um, but it's our view that uh, the home is an important setting to be addressed, uh, especially for individuals, caregivers, and service providers. Uh, for persons with ADL and IADL problems. And with NCOA, we developed a database of evidence-based programs in home modifications and home safety for reducing fall risks at home. One of these, I'm sure will be talked about later, uh, includes uh, Capable, developed by Sarah Santon of Johns Hopkins, it is a client-led intervention, including a registered nurse, an OT, and a handy person who makes home modifications. It is demonstrated to improve functioning and have an impact on falls. Uh, in addition, we've been trying to increase skills in the field. We've developed a compendium of assessment tools that can be used to identify fall risks and make adaptations. And it, we run a um, home modification uh, program, executive certificate in home modification. And uh, it's expanded and now has included students who are um, from federal agencies, including HHS and HUD. Um, third, we've tried to raise awareness of policymakers, government agencies, and service providers about the role of home modifications. It was on the agenda of a re recent Senate Special Committee on Aging that I think will be talked about later. Uh, fourth, uh, new sources of funds. Uh, I mentioned capable. But there's another inroad in healthcare. Well, modifications can now be covered as a supplemental benefit for chronically ill older persons under the Medicaid Advantage program for programs that choose to offer it. So that's a way we're getting the foot in the door in the health field uh, to address issues in the environment. Also, there's been a special $10 million allocation for home mods that HUD is going to administer. I think this was a, an outgrowth of the Senate uh, Committee on Aging's meetings, uh, and we're waiting to see how that rolls out. Um, finally, uh, we did get this grant uh, from the federal government, ACL. It includes N4A, Advancing States, and NCOA. And it is to promote aging in place by enhancing access to home modifications. It's great to see this kind of dedication and funding from ACL and uh, HHS and the involvement of a number, a number of different agencies in the federal government to try to address the issue of making homes safer and more supportive. 
So later, uh, I'm sure Emily is going to talk more about these issues. Turning it back to Kathy. Uh, yeah, Kathy, you just lost audio. So, um, let's see. I think that um, Samantha and Sarah were next. So, Kat, are you back, Kathy? Oh, there she is. Okay. John, you can't, she's lost audio. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think the next question was for Samantha and Sarah. Kathy, if you could just nod if that's correct. Um, that what was the impetus for the Senate Special Committee on Aging to focus on false prevention for the 2019 special report? So I think uh, Samantha and Sarah, you are on now. Um, can you hear me? Let's see. I got an email that they were that their audio was working now. Uh, let's just let's give them a second and Kathy a second to get back in. Okay. I really apologize okay. for that. Um, <laughs> I, That's so, okay. I, I completely lost my audio and couldn't get back in, so I had to uh, exit Zoom. So, um, Ellen, maybe we can go back to you since um, our policy colleagues have not been able to join yet. Um, yeah, I actually, I got uh, an, a text from Vinod saying that they thought they were in, but apparently not. Yeah, I'll, I'll resend the number. Um, okay. Sorry about that, everyone. But Ellen, yeah, um, okay. maybe to... Um, expand on your discussion earlier. Um, another recommendation in the action plan was around the expansion of evidence-based uh, programs and the needed infrastructure in order to make that happen. And what do you think are some of the most important accomplishments in the past five years um, regarding infrastructure? So yeah, there are a lot of accomplishments and it's hard to narrow it down, but I think I'm gonna focus just on four uh, major accomplishments regarding expanding that false prevention program infrastructure. Uh, first, in 2015, we were just one year into ACL, AOA, offering false prevention grants to disseminate evidence-based false prevention programming. And fortunately, that funding has continued annually since then. And there have been 68 grants awarded uh, 20, since 2014, and grantees have enrolled over 120,000 evidence-based false prevention program participants. So the grantees have done just a, an amazing job of building infrastructure to offer false prevention evidence-based programs within a number of networks, collaboratives, and, and just working with a variety of partners. As a second major accomplishment to build infrastructure for evidence-based false prevention programs, a number of grantees and states have created evidence-based program locators to help older adults, caregivers, and healthcare professionals actually find programs that are in their area. There's still more work to be done, but we have come a long way on that since 2015. Uh, third, our community-based partners are working with healthcare to make referrals to evidence-based programs. And the CDC study program that Ann mentioned earlier certainly contributed to that accomplishment. Again, there's more work to be done, but the recognition of and referral to community-based, evidence-based fall prevention programs is certainly a major uh, achievement and testament just to the stellar work that's being done by so many people out in the field. And finally, I wanna give a nod to the accomplishments of state and local fall prevention coalitions who are working to expand fall prevention program infrastructure. So they are working dilig diligently to increase the sectors of partners addressing fall prevention in their states and communities. They are creating strategic plans, increasing awareness of fall prevention, and disseminating evidence-based fall prevention program and programming. 
and we just applaud the great work that they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We couldn't reach the people across the country without the coalitions and, and the work that they have done in implementing programs and um, continuing to expand the work they do around Falls Prevention and Awareness Day, which is now going to be this year, Falls Prevention Awareness Week is, is so important to the field. So thank you, Ellen, so much. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And if we could go back to you and thinking about um, the future, what are some of the CDC's priorities for falls prevention in the next two to three years? Yes, thank you. I, I do have a couple of things um, to let you know about um, today. So the first thing is the clinical scale up. So creating the steady initiative really has been a tremendous success, but we still have a long way to go. So we need providers to commit to routinely screening, assessing, and intervening to reduce fall risk among their older patients. We need this at least once a year. So we're currently studying the cost benefit of implementing a steady-based program in primary care settings. So we can then use those results to encourage more health systems across the country to implement similar programs in primary care settings, which I think is important because you need the evidence that says this works. Um, the other thing I would say is um, a focus on older adult awareness. So over the last five years, CDC is focused on healthcare providers and what they can do in fall prevention. But for the next five years, we're going to add a focus for older adults. And we want older adults to know that injuries are not an inevitable part of aging. So falls, injuries from car crashes, traumatic brain injuries are preventable. So we recently started work on a new awareness campaign to educate older adults about preventable injuries and how some simple steps can improve their ability to remain healthy and independent longer. And fall prevention is our first priority in this activity. So we're going to start message testing some concepts. And then once the messages are tested and refined, then we'll launch the campaign probably within the next two years. Um, and they didn't like the um, message that I liked, which was act your age. So we'll have something that's more <laughs> refined and not cheeky. Um, so, so stay tuned about that. Thank you so much. And that, that's great. We look forward to um, working with you on that campaign. Um, you know, that's a big part two of what we want to do um, and what was in the National Action Plan around awareness and education. That's so key. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great, great. We look forward to that. Um, Emily, um, we have been working very closely together, gosh, for the, the past two years or so in the National Home Safety Work Group. And I would love to, for you to share a bit about some of the, uh, the work that we've been doing, some of the major accomplishments, and a little bit about the plans that we have for the coming year. Sure, Kathy, I'd be happy to, thank you. Um, NCOA and USC launched the National Home Safety and Home Modification Work Group in late 2017. And its mission is to engage key stakeholders to advance home safety and home modification policy, education, service delivery, and research. And the National Action Plan's home safety goals and strategies have really formed the foundation of our activities. The group is comprised of more than 20 organizations, including AARP, AOTA, APTA, the Bipartisan Policy Center, and Rebuilding Together. I could go, keep going. We've got these great members at the table and um, research universities as well. And as for major accomplishments, a key outcome is actually building these collaborations and bringing our voices from the aging, disability, housing, and healthcare sectors together to advance home safety and home modification. We've also supported important policy and advocacy efforts related to home modification, 
and we've developed an inventory of home modification related articles to compile the evidence and identify gaps. And in the coming year, a couple of our projects are really going to come to fruition. Um, we'll be disseminating infographics for consumers and policymakers on home modification. And we'll be creating a, or we've been creating, we're working diligently and we're excited to soon release a service delivery model that promotes home modification standards for providers and consumers. And this will give information such as like for a consumer, what skills should a professional have when I'm seeking someone to provide home modifications? Or what services should I expect to receive? Really empowering individuals in this process um, so they're more knowledgeable about what to expect. And as for professionals, we want to help them think more in terms of a collaborative team approach and understand, you know, when is it appropriate to bring in an accessibility specialist or a health professional, like an occupational therapist or a specialized physical therapist, or when is an architect really needed? And this came from real world challenges that the work group members have encountered. Time and time again, older adults or people with disabilities seek home modifications that will help make their home more accessible, safer, and make their daily activities easier. But in the end, they, what they get doesn't meet their needs. So this model and the accompanying resources um, aim to ensure that people in need of home modifications get the right services from the right providers at the right time. That's, that's great, Emily. Yeah, no, we've been really pleased to work with you and to engage, you know, so many partners across the country in this work. Um, one of the things that, you know, we're very concerned about, of course, right now is the increased risk of falls among older adults during the pandemic. Um, you know, because they are at home, um, many of them are social socially isolated, maybe not engaging in, in physical activity. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, your thoughts on, you know, what we can do during this time to help older adults maybe make their home safer, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah, we've been working on tailoring our resources so that we focus on low cost or no cost changes that are uh, fairly simple to execute in the home. Um, this could be removing clutter, removing or securing throw rugs, adding night lights, and even changing your behavior, keeping frequently used items um, in easy to reach places. And uh, some of these changes could also involve things you can order online, like durable medical equipment or, you know, like a night light. Um, and I'm aware that some groups out there are uh, incorporating telehealth strategies as well. So like meeting with an occupational therapist by phone or virtually, trying to adapt so, you know, we can address this need that's always been there, but might be getting um, more dire for some people who have less support as they're sheltering in, in their homes. Great. Yeah, so important. Thank you. Thank you. And we're seeing that too on the um, evidence-based falls prevention program side, where there have been a number of grantees and others who have really moved to virtual delivery um, you know, in the early days of the, the pandemic, figured out approaches to reach older adults using platforms like Zoom or Facebook Live. Um, particularly, we've seen this with um, Tai Chi for Arthritis, Tai Chi Kwan Moving for Better Balance, as well as um, Otago. And similar to what you were talking about, um, there are leaders in the field who are looking to do functional assessments virtually, you know, using some of the tools that the CDC has developed, but actually doing some of the tests like TUG um, in the home. So it's really exciting to see, um, you know, how things have moved so quickly um, during this pandemic, as Dr. Coughlin was talking about um, earlier today. So great. 
Well, we've had a little bit of a challenge getting our um, our colleagues from the Senate Special Committee on Aging, but I think one of them has just joined. Samantha, is that you or Sara? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Hello, this is Samantha. Hi, Samantha. How are you doing today? Good. I'm glad we were able to figure this out. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, um, both you and Sarah, for being part of this panel today. And your, your timing is quite optimal because we, um, we're sort of moving in the policy direction. So really excited um, to have you here with us today. Um, and we thought we'd spend a little bit of time, you know, talking about um, some of the work that's been happening um, relative to, to policy and that there's been a lot of activity over the last couple of years. Um, in particular, um, the Senate Special Committee on Aging Report last year. And we'd love to hear from you, um, you know, about what was the impetus for the Senate Special Committee on Aging um, to focus on falls prevention for their, um, the 2019 special report, which is here. Um, um, this is a report that was released last year. So I'd love to hear from you about a little bit of background on the report from your perspective. Sure. Um, well, I imagine that you all know this and heard from our previous speakers um, that the prevalence of falls and is just really staggering and the, the health and economic impacts of falls are quite drastic. And so even prior to our annual report and our work on falls and falls prevention and awareness, the Aging Committee has historically done an annual resolution every September recognizing the importance of falls and falls prevention awareness day broadly. Um, and also falls and falls prevention is something that my colleague Sara from Senator Collins office who has also joined us on the line um, and I have been meeting with advocates over the last few years um, regarding falls and falls prevention and, and every year the aging committee writes an annual report and ultimately the topic of that report and the work of the committee is driven not only by what's happening in the aging network um, and with all of you who are, have joined us today but also what is happening with seniors in Pennsylvania and Maine, the states that our um, respective bosses represent, and then just generally seniors across the country. And, and, and really every year when we think about what our annual report is going to be on, we think about who we've been speaking to and the issues that we've been working or hearing from advocates and seniors on. And, and also importantly, when we were picking the topic, uh, no one else in Congress was really working on this issue related to falls and falls prevention. So given the number of conversations we had been having about falls and falls prevention and and honestly, the overall advocacy of the network on this issue, it just seemed like such an important topic for the committee to undertake. And we spent quite a few months um, having conversations. We had an open request for input and we had, I think over 200 individuals submit comments. Um, and ultimately that culminated in the re release of our report in October. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, and I recommend um, those attendees at this session. If you haven't seen the report, again, you can get it um, through the Senate Special Committee on Aging. Really great report. So, um, Sarah and Samantha, if you could talk for a few minutes about, you know, some of the priority areas in the report that you and others will be focusing on um, in the coming years. Hi, this is Sara Kasawana from the Senate Aging Committee. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Sara. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love it when technology works the way it's supposed <laughs> to. It's a pleasure to join you all in this conversation. So I'll build a little bit off of what Samantha shared. A lot of our um, findings actually emerged both from the research that we conducted as well as from the priorities that we heard from advocates on. And once we put all of that together, we came up with uh, a few key recommendations that I'd like to focus on today. And one has already been discussed a little bit earlier, but um, I'd like to underscore it because this is a priority that the committee is uh, planning to continue to work on. The first is raising awareness to prevent falls. So the report recommends that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and other federal departments develop a national educational campaign to raise awareness and lift evidence-based programs. We all know that a number of effective programs for falls prevention exist, 
but unfortunately, they're not as widely utilized as they should be. And that's often due to system level barriers that we can overcome with a concerted effort. So uh, this, this awareness campaign would help us overcome those barriers. It would help us expand access to evidence-based programs and reduce stigma, shame, and fear of falling. And that um, recognizing the importance of that campaign is something that we do traditionally in the resolution that Samantha talked about and uh, highlighting it as a key recommendation in the report points to this as something that we plan to work on um, even in the, uh, in the future as well. A second recommendation that I would like to share is targeting modifiable risk factors. Some of the other panelists talked about specific risk factors like um, home modifications, and that's one that we found that would be particularly effective to target. So the committee recommends investing in programs that offer home safety evaluations and modifications, as well as improving the dissemination of information and resources available for home assessments and modifications. And that second piece on information and resources is actually something that we tackled in the 2020 reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. So we're really proud of being able to incorporate that new policy and we'll look forward to seeing what comes of it and continuing to push it in the right direction. The committee also recommends that CMS explore pilot programs for other modifiable risk factors that can prevent secondary um, fracture prevention, such as supportive services. The goal is really to improve outcomes and reduce costs, and those, those are both achievable by targeting what we know to be evidence-based modifiable risk factors. Finally, the last recommendation that I'll focus on now is reducing polypharmacy. We all know the link between multiple medications and uh, falls uh, risk. So uh, the committee recommends that CMS develop uh, medication review best practices as part of the Medicare annual wellness visit. And the committee report also recommends that FDA and NIH continue to assess the impacts of polypharmacy on older adults and make a more concerted effort to include older adults in clinical trials, particularly for drugs in which older adults will constitute the majority of the intended population. And this is an area where we've made some progress in through language that we were able to include in appropriations requiring um, FDA to um, assess the impacts of polypharmacy and uh, ensure that older adults are included and they've recently issued guidance on this subject. So we look forward to continuing to working with all of you on these policy priorities and shaping them as we move forward. Thank you, Sarah and Samantha. That, that was really helpful um, in thinking about you know, some of the future initiatives in regards to policy changes. And you know, so glad to hear about the work that you think is, is important in terms of the um, annual wellness visit, that's something that we're going to continue to work on at NCOA in regards to falls risk assessment and um, medication reviews. So that, that's great. Um, well, we have time left um, and we have several questions that have come in and I'd like to start some of those questions. Um, thank you all, uh, all the panelists for, for great remarks. This has been really helpful. Um, the first is for John and for Emily, and that is, what strategies do you recommend to communicate with individuals in the building industry about the necessity to increase their knowledge and skills for home modifications? <laughs> I know that's something you've thought a lot about over the years. Great question. It's a very good question. Um, I think um, builders, and real estate people are realizing that uh, older persons are um, big consumers of housing. Uh, they want to age in place. And when people are looking for new places, they're starting to look for places that have 
easy to live on one floor, bathrooms are accessible, no step entrances. We're trying to change the way housing is built in the first place so that accommodates people with disabilities and older persons uh, as they age. So I, I think there's a big effort in that direction. And I think uh, older persons are making note of it, but it's also younger people who have been caring for their parents mm -hmm. who realize how difficult it is to do it in a house that's not accessible and supportive. So from that own, their own experience, I think they're thinking about, well, how do I plan ahead for my future and for my older relatives' future as well? Uh, second is we're trying to um, improve the skills of the building industry and remodelers uh, and handymen to give them the skills to know how to deal with clients uh, to ensure that the changes they make are the ones that people really uh, feel are important. It's sort of the client-led uh, approach uh, and teach them how to work with other professionals such as occupational therapists, social workers, um, and any, anyone else who might be involved with uh, older persons in the healthcare sector. Emily, do you want to add something? Sure, maybe also uh, communicating that some changes can be more universal and support people as they age, with people of all ages and abilities, um, and that some of these changes in, in new builds um, aren't necessarily more expensive to make and are more appreciated by the people who will be living there. I know that there are some uh, communities or counties that are also working on changing codes or incorporating language um, uh, policies into new builds for older adults to ensure that they have, um, that they incorporate these, uh, you know, accessibility features and supportive features. Thank you both. Um, kind of piggybacking on that question um, for Sarah and Samantha, I know earlier this year, Senator King had I was working on a proposal around tax incentives for um, home modifications. And I wondered if um, that has progressed any, um, you know, kind of what you see in the future for something like that to incentivize individuals um, through the tax system to make home modifications. There are a number of states that have put in place these tax incentives for um, home modifications and accessibilities, but having something at the federal level would be really important as well. Yeah, this is Samantha. Um, you know, that's a great question. I'm not exactly sure um, where Senator King's legislation is at at the moment. Um, when I'm done, Sarah might have a thought and can add to this as well, I think that as of moving, as related to moving anything in Congress right now, I think that uh, it's pretty obvious that we're in really challenging times right now. And a lot, if not all of the work coming out of Congress um, at the moment is, has really been directly related to COVID um, or even we're starting to hear about some of these like must pass, must reauthorize bills that, that may be moving, things that need to happen before the end of the federal fiscal year. Um, so that being said, I think that it's helpful right now for advocates and all of you on the line to really take a look at um, what your priorities are and the things that were talked about earlier on this webinar and, and figure out where those priorities fit and categorize them really well. There are some things that can be accomplished through conversations with congressional offices and letters to the administration. Other things will require legislation like Senator King's bill that you mentioned. And, and of course, it's uh, more important now than ever for these bills to be bipartisan to have a chance of moving here in Congress and 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 while the work that we're doing is really narrowly focused at the moment there will be a time in the future uh, where there are opportunities to move bills that are not directly related to COVID and some of the mm -hmm. things that are happening in our country at the moment so I think that um, what I would advise is for you all to be ready and to continue advocacy and and 
when it's time, there will be space for you all to come and talk to your representatives and have a united front with clear asks and stories from constituents or even potentially drafted letters or ideas for letters and legislation. And, and that's where I think all of this fits in. And it's not easy to get anything to move in Congress these days, but uh, knowing the aging network, you guys are a mighty force. And so I think that um, your advocacy will be immensely helpful in getting some of this stuff to happen. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah, and I'll make a plug for a session right after this one that's going to focus on the role of community-based organizations and those who work in the field of aging to become more involved in healthy aging advocacy. So thank you for that. Sara, did you want to add anything else? Yeah, I'll add that this is an issue that Senator Collins has long partnered with Senator King on and um, one bill, the one that I mentioned briefly that we were able to include in the 2020 Older Americans Act reauthorization is based off of the Senior and Disability Home Modification Assistance Initiative Act, which um, Senator Casey um, worked uh, with us on as well. It was a large bipartisan group, and uh, that bill would establish a cross-cutting initiative. Um, to coordinate all of the different federal efforts and programs on home modification and resources and assistance to get that more quickly to those who are um, in need. And uh, we weren't able to get 100% of the bill in the reauthorization, but we were able to get the core. And uh, that's something that we imagine uh, we'll, we'll have continued follow-up actions on as we continue to work to be able to achieve the goal of providing seniors with the resources that they need to be able to um, address this important um, modifiable risk factor. Great. I'd just like to say one comment in relationship to that. Through our ACL grant, uh, we are working with departments of energy, housing, health, aging, agriculture, to coordinate various programs that fund some aspect of home modification to make the best use of the resources that are out there. Uh, these agencies often go their own separate ways and people in the field don't know how to access them. And that's one of our goals of this uh, ACL project. Thank you, John. Great. Um, our next question I want to direct to both Ellen Schneider and Ann Dellinger. And the question is, how is the University of North Carolina review process for evidence-based programs different than the CDC process for the Falls Prevention Program Compendium? Um, and when will the CDC update the compendium? Well, I could, uh, I could start and then Ann, if I'm not sure the answer about the CDC updating the Falls uh, Compendium. But just in terms of how the process differs, um, the, the Title III D evidence-based program process focuses on the whole gamut of offering a program. Um, the CDC uh, compendium process was really focused on research and making sure that the programs that were in there were effective. But we, again, since this is for all five, uh, Title III D recipients to be able to use the programs, have to make sure that there's training available, that the program can be implemented. So we are looking not just at, um, again, the research effectiveness outcomes, which are so important, but also implementation of the programs and making sure that if a senior center out there wants to offer whatever program is going through the review process, that they're going to have the training available. They're going to have the um, there's somebody going to be on the other end of the line if they, they need to make a call. So, um, so again, we're trying to do kind of the soup to nuts to make sure that that program is, is ready to, to go if, if somebody, if an organization does try to or decides to implement it. And Anne, if you wouldn't mind uh, addressing if the CDC is updating the false Revenge compendium, that would be great. No, I think we might have lost Anne. I'm not sure. I don't see her um, on our, our Zoom windows. So we can come back. Hopefully she can rejoin um, the call. But Ellen, maybe we'll stick with you because there are a number of questions that have come up regarding um, evidence-based programs being um, more flexible 
adaptable. Um, if you have any comments kind of around some work that's being done currently to maybe make programs um, less expensive to implement, more adaptable for a variety of, of different uh, population groups, particularly those maybe with sensory or physical disabilities, as well as those who um, speak other languages. Sure. And, and Kathy, I, I might, uh, since I know you're well attuned to some of what's going on with that, I might um, yeah. turn around and ask you to speak to that as well. But um, certainly, in this age of COVID-19, um, a lot is being done to look at offering programs virtually, um, to, which of course would help to reach different populations. Um, you know, we realize of course that that's not gonna work for everybody, it's not gonna work for every program, but it does help to reach where they have the technology, where people are technically literate. literate it does help to reach some different populations. So that is something that's being looked at very carefully while trying to, of course, maintain fidelity to um, why the program is evidence-based in the first place. Um, as we do the review process, we highly encourage programs that reach different populations to apply. Um, I'm gonna be talking, we're gonna be talking about newly approved programs at 3.30, but one of them is um, a diabetes program specifically for, uh, for Hispanics. And so we have seen some programs that are coming through that are more, uh, you know, again, are trying to reach some of the, the harder to reach populations or maybe where there haven't been alternatives before. Um, I'll have to say, when we do the review process, um, we don't look at costs, and let me tell you why. We feel it's not our job to say this is too expensive or, or not. Um, we leave that, we, we ask the program applicants to provide what their costs are so that an organization can look at a program and say, yes, we can afford that. That looks like something that will meet the needs of our, our population or, you know, that's not gonna work for us because it's too expensive. So, um, so again, we do try to make sure that that information is available so that organizations can make their own choices and, uh, you know, what's, what's going to work for their population. With that, Kathy, I'll just turn that over to you if there's more you want to talk about. No, I think you, you summarized it really well. I just want to add that the last few years, we've been working very closely on adaptations for Native American populations. Um, we put together... Um, an advisory board of experts in the in the field of uh, tribal aging to to help us in those efforts. And we've done um, a national survey with Older Americans Act Title VI programs to learn about programs that they're implementing. And um, so that we're gonna have a report that's gonna come out in the next couple of months. And one one of the questions came in. Um, do we know if there's a national expert on culturally appropriate falls prevention interventions? I would direct. Um, the person who asked this question to the National Resource Center on Native American Aging at the University of North Dakota. Also, the Indian Health Service has an injury prevention unit and they've done um, a tremendous amount of work over the years on false prevention for tribal elders. Um, so- yeah, and, if, and Kathy, if I could add, um, Washington State is working with uh, an organization to um, translate um, at least one false prevention program so that it is more culturally appropriate for Native American populations. Right. So, um, yeah, Washington State Public Health is doing some great work there. Yeah. So there's a lot of activity in regards to uh, program adaptations, flexibility, et cetera, for, for programs. So we've, we've come to the end of our hour, and I want to um, thank all of the panelists for, for doing a great job. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for joining us uh, for this session. Um, before you go, please remember to rate this session on the mobile app and to tweet using the hashtag um, AgeAction. Um, and then over the next 30 minutes, we encourage um, all of you to visit the virtual expo hall. <laughs> That's a first um, to complete and to complete the, uh, the scavenger hunt. So that should be fun. Um, and then to access the next session that you want to attend, 
And um, Ellen Schneider is going to be speaking about the evidence-based program review process. Ann Dellinger is going to be speaking later this afternoon about the CDC's activities in a little bit more detail. I'm going to be speaking with our policy team next about, again, ways in which you can become more involved in um, healthy aging advocacy. So please go back to the agenda tab on the homepage of the Age Action website. And thanks again for, for joining us today. Have a good rest of the conference. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Thank you.